Gregory Asher, how you doing? I'm doing great, cousin. It, it's so good to see you, uh, Billy. I know you was referred to by Billy. So. Yeah, yeah. And they say Billy, I know they've been around for a minute. That's what Mama called me and everybody else, Billy. Yeah, yeah. And I remember, I remember Yeah, Tini. Uh, referring to me. Yeah, called yeah. Me Billy. Yeah. yeah. So right. that's just what they called me growing up. That's fine. And I, every okay. now and then it's a William or a Bill, but I answer the holiday. I'm really glad that you took the time to come on the show. And I know that we're going to talk a little bit about where were you? I grew up uh, in Compton, California, born and raised in uh, 1956. It was a total of 10 children to my mom and my dad. Because my dad, uh, Sidney uh, E. Asher Sr., uh, hashtag Robinson. Kind of wondering where the Robinson came from, you know, and because I was always curious about that. There was 10 of us, we grew up, you know, we went, we went through some issues with my dad. My dad was dealing with some problems that, you know, that was, uh, it was, he carried a monkey on his back. My mom raised us, uh, two, of, two of my brothers and sisters, they uh, died at birth. So it was a total of eight of us, four girls and four boys. Didn't have a whole lot, but you know, the little we had, we shared it, made sure everybody had some, you know, we went through some hard times. The period where well, when I came up, we was dealing with the uh, Watts riot, early 60s, you know, and the assassination of uh, Kennedy, you know, JFK, and then, uh, you know, the assassination of Martin. Things was rough, but, you know, my mom always seemed to uh, find a way to survive, you know, and find a way to keep us uh, pointing in the right direction. Raising eight kids, especially four boys, you know, is, I mean, to, but today, Sam, that I couldn't see anybody doing that, you know, and, uh, but my mom, you know, she kind of ruled with an iron fist. So whatever was going on outside the house, you know, I was more afraid of my mom than I was of who was going out on the street. I think we were just kind of raised like that. Because, you know, even my grandmother, you know, we, I just feared them women. Once again, even way back then, this uh, culture of the father not really being present in the home, not really right. doing their part in the home. Um, how did that kind of affect you? I know how it affected me, but this is your story. 
Well, I mean, it it affected me in, in a bad way because, you know, I, I can remember my older brothers, uh, two older brothers, and my dad used to coach baseball. And when they were coming up, you know, my dad was coaching, you know, but I never got the opportunity to experience that. It wasn't really all my dad's uh, fault that uh, he wasn't in the home. You know, back in those days, the system, you know, was taking the men out of the house, you know. When they came up with that uh, welfare, families were getting county assistance, but the, but the husband couldn't be in the home, you know. And so I remember a time, when, you know, when social worker used to come home and my dad used to hide in the closet, you know, so he wouldn't be seen in the home, you know. And, you know, so it, it, it pushes out and then with his, you know, with his problem, you know, I didn't get the opportunity to play sports, for him to see me play sports or, you know, or anything really, because from the time I was probably in the fifth grade it was when my dad was coming and going. I used to be envious of, of guys that had their fathers. You know, because, you know, all my events that, that took place in my years growing up, my mom was the center point, you know, because my dad wasn't in the picture. It kind of made me feel like, okay, well, I'm not going to be that type of father. If 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 I'm going to have kids, then I'm going to make sure that I'm in everything that they partake in, you know, even to the point where I, I I noticed now in my older years that by me making that statement and living up to that statement, you know, I overshot what I should have done. I believe that, you know, by not having my dad made me be like that, you know, because I was like, well, I would never desert my kids or, or not be part of their lives, you know, because my dad, he, uh, they moved to Oregon, you know, and that was during the time I was in high school. I didn't know why my dad moved, you know, all the way to Oregon at that time, but I found out later, you know, because the system, you know, were prosecuting what they considered deadbeat dads. I did a lot of things that, you know, uh, I was ashamed about that took me away from being the father that I wanted to be because I started getting heavily into the drugs. And, you know, this was during the time after I got out of the military, you know, and because I remember one time I took my daughter with me, my oldest daughter. At that time, she was probably 11 and I took her to a dope house with me. And I told her to sit out, sit out in the car and I'll be right back. And that was, was like, ooh, this was like early in the morning. And by the time I came back out, it was late in the evening. You know, the, the financial thing was taking a toll, you know, because my finances, I was spending more than I, sh I should have on you know, doing what I was doing, and, and that was taken from the household. It seems like to be at a point where you're doing what you just said to me, seemed like you were kind of caught up. You know, that didn't sound like one time move. There's been several times where, you know, I, I put my, you know, not only my life at risk, but my kids' lives at risk chasing things that I shouldn't have been chasing, you know, and it just, I started feeling less than I, than I should have been. I was like, man, you know, I never thought that I would be doing this, you know, but the, the thought was fleeting, you know, because whatever I was doing was in control, you know, and no matter what I had to do, to, to get it, <laughs> you know, wait, wait, wait. It, it was just, 
Wait, wait, cuz, wait, wait. I don't want to hop over that. Yeah. Right. Don't don't tell me nothing that you know because we it'll be broadcast. But when you say do whatever to get it, that had that had a little cut to it. Mm -hmm. oh. The cut is the the embarrassing, you know, feeling. You know, because you know when I when I think about it, even today, the pain and 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 the the deep down dark feeling, you know, surfaces, you know, and because I mean, you know, because it was rough times. You said you do it, you know, do things. It sounds like somebody that if you had around you. You laid something down or something. You might have to keep my eye on you. Yeah, it it was like that. You know, it, you know, it was like you know, if you laid it down uh, and and you weren't looking, you know, it, 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 <laughs> I don't know what happened to it. I didn't see it. I promise you, I didn't see it. People was cautious of you. You know, because they knew what was going on, and you know, in spite of you thinking that, you know, hey, you know, I I got it all together. You know, I'm 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 still looking looking sharp. You know, I, although I didn't lost about sixty pounds. Seriously, you sound like you were really sprung, Greg. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It 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 was. It was, you know. I mean, it was just something that uh, took over. You know, I mean, when when the cocaine epidemic came about, it was just man, it was it was it was a, a wonder drug, to be honest with you. You know, and 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 you know, it was it was the first drug that that I actually fell in love with. You know, because it was like, man, this you know this this feels you know like euphoria. Let me let me ask you this. Whereas when you were going through this, were your kids staying with you, the mother? What was the situation for the children? Well, at, well, in the beginning, they were staying with both of us. As the years passed, you know, we started having relationship problem with their mom, you know, and you know, we we kind of split up for a minute, when, you know, went our own way. And then came back together and we made a geographical move. You know, we moved up to Portland, you know, and we moved up there in 1980, you know, to try to see if we can get it back together, you know, which, you know, was, was a waste of time. You know, we, we only stayed up there, what, maybe a couple of years, you know, and then we ended up coming back. And, you know, I went right back to, you know, what I was doing. I was back around the, the connections. Eventually, we uh, split up. We separated, you know, and the kids, uh, in the beginning, they came to stay with me because of certain things that was going on in the mom's household, you know, and so they came to stay with me. But at that time, I was still dealing with my drug problem, you know, and I was staying with my mom you know, at at that time. And, you know, so I ended up bringing my two kids, my two oldest kids to live with me at my mom's house, you know, and that was, uh, that was a struggle in, in itself, you know, because I'm trying to work, you know, my kids, you know, my, now my mom, I'm depending on my mom to make sure my kids get to school and get home okay. It was a strain, it was a struggle. Can you get into like about how long this lasted and and what happened when you started to pull up and when you really turned your back on this type of lifestyle? It it actually it really started when I went into the military in 1974 and uh, you know that's when I really started drinking because you know growing up during my early years I really wasn't into drugs and alcohol you know and then in the military you know i started drinking 
you know, and then I got introduced to drugs and I started doing different drugs, you know, and so, you know, it went on through my last two years in the military. And then when I get out, got out, I kind of st steered straight a little bit, you know, or, uh, or I pushed the gorilla down, you know, he, he wasn't standing on me. He was behind me. But he wasn't standing. He wasn't standing on me, you know. So, but eventually, you know, it caught back up to me. You know, I started doing the things that that you know I shouldn't have been doing: drinking a lot, uh, smoking a lot of weed. You know, doing and you know, and at that time, you know, I used to tell people, you know, I identify as a more. You know, the more you got, the more I'll do it. You know, and. Uh, so I started experimenting with a lot of different um, drugs, you know, angel dust, um, this, this drug they call Lovely, uh, uh, you know, PCP. Uh, yeah, they call water. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Water, go, lovely, go, okay. Yeah, yeah, you go get that dip. When I left the military, when I was over in Korea, uh, man, I was over there drinking. I remember when I used to go down to the clubs and I see these brothers in the clubs doing this, you know, they doing this all night. And I asked the brother, I said, man, I said, what's going on? He said, oh, they drinking that not, you know, they drinking that liquid codeine. And I was like, oh, man, I never do that shit, you know. And uh, about two weeks later, I was sitting in the club, you know, <laughs> here and nodding, you know, so... I started drinking that and then, you know, using a lot of different pills and stuff, you know, and then it was it was happening in spurts, you know, after I got out of the military, like I said, I kind of cleaned myself up, kind of went straight. Then, you know, it started coming back because my ex-wife, her brothers and stuff, you know, they were, you know, heavily into the gangs and into the drug thing, you know, and, you know, they would be cooking up the stuff around, you know, and shit, I was like, well, yeah, you know, you cooking it up, you know, after you do what you do, I'm going to take the bowl, I'll take the bowl, you know, I'll get the rest of the chips off the bowl, <laughs> you know, and so that went on until about 94. I went and told my mom, I said, mom, I said, I got a problem. You know, and she said, what is it? I told her, you know, I said, I got a problem with cocaine. And she said, well, it's about time you admitted it. You know, and I was like, what you mean? You know, she's like, well, everybody knew but you. I got introduced to a, a drug treatment program at Kaiser. And um, I went in there in 94, and I'll never forget. Uh, you remember this uh, movie character named uh, Huggy Bear? Yep. He played on uh yeah, yeah the okay. Fish, uh, right, the right, fish right. Fish yeah, the platform, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I remember him. Yeah. Well well his brother his brother was working at, at Kaiser in the drug treatment program. And when I saw him, I was like, Man, I'm like, I don't know if that's Huggy Brad, all right. So um, you know, I mean he was a hardcore, he was a straight liner. You know, he was he was doing the straight line with the uh, heroin. He started talking to him, and I was telling him, I said, man, I need a, uh, something, you know, to help me battle this demon that I'm dealing with. And he said, well, the only thing they have is a, a, a outpatient program, right? So I was like, man, I need an inpatient program. I need to be locked up somewhere, you know, so... He told me, he said, well, Gray, he said, I'm going to be honest with you. He said, the only thing we got is this uh, outpatient program. He said, but if you're really tired, you know, he said, you take anything that comes your way if you're really tired, right? And I told him, I said, man, I, I'm tired, you know, but I had two primos rolled up in my pocket, you know, and I was like, okay, well, you, uh, I check in Monday, so this is Friday, so Saturday and Sunday, I can continue doing what I'm doing. Right, I right. On Monday, you right. had it all figured out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had a, I had a plan. 
that weekend, you know, I tried, I tried, and I tried, and I tried, and it seemed like no matter what I did, I was not getting the effect, you know, that that I once got, you know, and so that Monday, I showed up early. I showed up at seven o'clock. I stayed in the program. It went from seven to uh, seven to three thirty. Right? But the requirements is you had to do a meeting before the program and a meeting after the program, right? And so he said that if you do that, he said, you won't give yourself time to think of nothing else, right? So I got up. I used to go to this early bird meeting. I get up at 5 o'clock in the morning, be at the meeting at 6. The meeting lasts an hour. I get from there to Kaiser. I check into the day treatment program. I do the program for um, the whole day. Then after I get out, I go to a meeting and I'll be like, well, I don't really feel nothing. So I say, okay, well, I'm going to go to another meeting. All right. So by the time I got out of that meeting, I was too tired to do anything else. So I went home and crashed and I did that. The next day, and and I did it the next day, and I I did it the next day, you know. And before I knew it, uh, you know, I had thirty days, you know, under under my belt. I had committed myself to do whatever it took, you know, to fight what I was fighting, you know, because he told me if you just put yourself around the right people in the right circumstances you know, you'll be okay. You give yourself a safety net, you know, so that's what I did. I'm glad that things worked out for you. I'm glad that you kept putting it behind yeah. you because it seemed like you, you were killing yourself. Not only yourself, it's like you're oh, killing yeah. other people too. Right. What's yeah. your relationship yeah. with your children and, and the late and your ex-wife and all that? Uh, well, there's no relationship with my ex-wife nor my two oldest kids. But that was something that I fought for a long time because my son, my son is 46 and my daughter's 44. And when, when me and the mom separated, my son was 16 and my daughter was 14. So, you know, so that's been like 30 years. I never really understood why my wife, I mean, my ex-wife, I'm just going to leave. My ex-wife, you know, why she felt the way she felt because she was the one who decided to move on with her life. I ended up meeting uh, another young lady, a lot younger than me, you know, and, you know, but I met her at a time where, you know, I was, alone, lonely, um, in need, you know, and uh, so we ended up uh, getting together and my daughter and my son, you know, they were coming back and forth, you know, living with me, you know, as well as she was. You know, she always had respect for my kids, you know, I mean, she treated them be honest with you, a lot better than their own mom did. I had moved on, you know, with my life. Not, not, not saying that you can't be part of my life, but you have to accept where I'm at in, in my life, you know, as well as me accepting where you are. I tried over and over again to make amends with my kids. It never came about. You know, and it's been, you know, like I said, it's been over 20 years, you know, that we've not had any type of relationship at all. My current wife, you know, we have a, we have a stable relationship, you know, and, you know, we have two girls together and I have a beautiful relationship with these two. I would just like to say something to you, cousin, uh, uh, the years that you're talking about in the relations. I had a child, mm -hmm. my first child. If you look on here, her name is Mary. And if you ever go through some of our interviews, we did one. 
It was 35 years. The Lord, God, Jesus, the higher power, whatever you feel comfortable saying, right. know that something clicked inside of you. And we were raised like that, but it doesn't really mean anything until you accept. Can you just really get into some of the moments of when you really started listening to that voice inside and when you started to understanding that when things were leaving you and you were being delivered, how joy and peace started to come into your world? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, one of the uh, main experiences that helped me deal with um, the issue with my ex-wife, you know, because my, my ex-wife, she crossed the street, you know, and, and that really, you know, kind of made me hit rock bottom, you know, because I was like, man, you know, I, I, how, how are my homeboys going to see me, you know, I mean, man, you know, I can understand that, you know, if she left you for another dude, you know, but leave you for another female, you know, that, <laughs> you know, that, that kind of, kind of sting, that kind of stings a little bit, you know. Well, another episode of Where Were You? And we would like to thank our guests for this evening. Also want to thank New Me. New Me helps sponsor Where Were You? So go on and check it out. New Me forward slash Arcway. Also, go on and hit that like. Go on and hit subscribe. Go on and hit that share. Go on and leave a comment. And if you find anyone that has a story, let me know. And hey, you bless someone today. <laughs>